When aliens accidentally crash on Earth and obliterate two people, they replace their bodies with living mechanical weapons and grant them godly powers as compensation. One of the individuals uses this power for fun, engaging in killing, while the other uses it for helping. This is the story of two overpowered individuals with different ideals. Ichi Inuyashiki is a timid middle-aged worker who has finally gotten a house for his family. However, his children are unimpressed after learning that it's a modest house instead of a lavish house next door. He tells them to unpack things but gets ignored, and they go to dinner at a nearby restaurant without him. He unpacks alone, feeling a twinge in his back. Fishing out a piece of paper from his pocket, he glances at a medical exam slip and orders dinner for himself. Later, in the subway, he imagines going against a group of rude students but retreats into cowardice. In the park, he sees an abandoned dog in a box and takes it home. Despite objections from his family, he keeps the dog in his room and names it Hago. In a hospital, Ichi does various health checkups and discovers that he has stomach cancer and has only three months to live. He tries to call his family to inform them of the terrible news, but none of them answer his calls. Feeling despair, he goes to a park and cries alone. He tries to tell his family at home but gets dismissed once again, with his daughter denying him as her father and his wife nagging him for his dog. He brings Hago to the park and cries as he wonders if his family would even shed tears for him had they known he has cancer. As he cries, he notices a teenage boy beside him who's looking at the dark sky. Suddenly, the sky glows, followed by a powerful explosion. As Hago barks, distorted voices talk about restoring the life forms they accidentally destroyed. The next morning, Ichi wakes up in the park with no recollection of what happened, feeling refreshed. He goes home with Hago and gets incredibly thirsty. He also discovers that his back no longer hurts, and he can now see clearly without his eyeglasses. As he gets his medical examination, the doctors are baffled to discover that he no longer has cancer. Feeling strange, he goes back home, only to discover that his body can mysteriously give off steam. Hago licks his palm, resulting in his arm transforming into a gun-like weapon, but it shoots his dinner from the day before on the wall. He feels different parts of his body, and upon touching his chin, his head transforms into a cyborg-like weapon. Trying to think everything over, he goes to the park, remembers the events from the other night, and decides to find the young man he was with, as he must have had the same struggles as him. Meanwhile, a homeless man speaks to his wife on the phone, pleading for another chance with her. Grateful for the fresh start, he promises to work really hard this time and make her happy. Ichi touches his ear, and suddenly hears the voices of teenagers coming their way with evil plans. As the man happily stares at the photo of his wife, the teenagers try to shoot firecrackers at him and surround him while holding baseball bats. The man begs them to let him off the hook as he plans to start a new life. However, the teenagers are merciless and shoot firecrackers again, setting him on fire. Ichi hears the assault but tries to ignore it and leave. Tired of being a coward, he comes back and bravely walks towards the teens. As they run out of fireworks to shoot at him, they surround him and beat him with bats. As he falls unconscious to the ground, the teenagers presume that he's already dead and begin to walk toward the homeless man to beat him up next. Just then, a camera in the back of Ichi's head activates and scans the park, targeting the teens. He shoots white beams at them, knocking them to the ground and saving the homeless man. The same camera downloads all of their social media information and identities, posting them online and broadcasting them on television for everyone to see. The homeless man thanks Ichi for saving him, and for the first time in his life, he feels alive. Alone, he cries out of happiness, and he realizes that despite his transformation into a robot, he remains a human with a heart. Ichi gazes at his cyborg appearance in the mirror and doesn't feel good about it. Despite this, he continues his mundane life grappling with the realization that he now possesses extreme robotic powers. He swears to save as many lives as he can, so he can prove that he is still a human. Meanwhile, at school, a student named Hiro is talking with his classmate, who is enthralled by Mari's beauty. However, Hiro is unimpressed, as he doesn't like mean people. He remarks that his closest friend Ando is not present again, and wonders if it is because he got beat up the other day. Later he visits his friend, who is curled up in bed, in an attempt to get his attention, he tries to lure him with his new comics, but the friend doesn't even budge. He continues to read and tears up in one of the comic scenes, although he still looks emotionless. 
He then asks if his friend knows about the serial killer who has been causing fear lately and has killed eight people. Nonchalantly, he says that he suspects it was his friend since he skipped school for days. Finally getting his attention, Ando gets up from the bed and emptily looks at him. Hiro laughs, clearly just messing with his friend. He then stands up and tells Ando that he's not the same anymore, and he proceeds to show him his robotic brain. Ando is freaked out, asking him how he did the magic trick, not believing it is true at all. Instead of answering, Hiro asks his friend to go outside and uses his power to kill a crow, saying that it is part of the magic trick he learned. They then go to a store with TVs on display and make all of them play adult content. Ando finds it amusing, asking his friend how he pulls it off. Hiro tells him that the show isn't over yet and proceeds to intentionally cause traffic incidents in front of his friend. Seeing this, Ando realizes that it is not about magic tricks anymore. In his home, Ando is having a hard time processing everything, fearful of his friend's mental state and powers. He asks if his friend will kill him. Hiro assures him he's not. Ando suggests he can become a hero and save people with his newfound powers. However, Hiro dismisses this and convinces him to return to school, calmly offering to kill the student who beat him up. As his friend leaves, Ando is torn about what to do with his discovery and wonders if Hiro is still the same friend he has had since childhood, not believing that he can actually eliminate someone. However, he remembers that when they were still children, Hiro would act like a psychopath, not caring what happened to others unless they were his family or friends. Meanwhile, Hiro receives a phone call from his mother, which he fondly answers and expresses excitement about their family fishing trip over the weekend. On his way home, Hiro chooses a random home and calmly enters as if it were his home. He encounters a woman and shoots an invisible beam using his finger, making her lifeless in an instant. He then goes to the bathroom, where a man and his son are taking a bath. The man is shocked to see a stranger in his house and tries to shield his son from him when he shoots an invisible bullet. Learning that his wife is already dead, he pleads for his son's life, but Hiro heartlessly ends theirs, feeling alive from it. Just then, the daughter comes home, witnessing the gruesome incident that happened to her family. As she grieves, Hiro asks about her favorite comics instead, like a true psychopath. Upon learning that she reads the same comic as him, his interest is piqued, but he finds pleasure in her fear, so he wounds her. Meanwhile, Ichi goes home and is greeted by Hago. He presses his ear, and his enhanced hearing is activated. He then hears the girl's screams of fear, pleading for her life. He drives, following the voice he hears in his head, but gets stuck in traffic, and he hears her ultimately die. He finally arrives at the house and finds the lifeless bodies of the victims. He blames himself for failing to help despite having his superhuman powers. Just then, Hiro spots him, believing that he missed killing the grandpa of the house. He points his finger at Ichi and fires, causing the man to be thrown because of the impact. As Hiro leaves, however, he has already recovered and stands at the doorway, much to the young man's surprise. Threatened, he uses his robotic body and flies to escape. Meanwhile, Ichi finally finds the person he has been looking for, but he is not what he expected. Later, Ichi wakes up from a nightmare and blames himself for not being able to save the family, who faced a gruesome fate. He watches the update on the news and contemplates if he can stop the young man from his murderous spree. Meanwhile, at school, Hiro wonders why the old man he encountered didn't die when he hit him and worries if his finger is busted. He visits Ando and convinces him again to return to school. However, his friend seems lost in thought and cuts his finger while reading comics. Hiro holds his wounded finger, and it heals in no time. He tells his friend that with his power, he can probably cure other serious diseases like cancer, but he can't heal his emotional scars. Ando falls silent again, not showing any interest in going back to school. Ichi is on his way home when he encounters a group of delinquents intimidating a guy who spoke against them. The man shakes in fear and offers his money, but the gang just laughs at him. As the leader is about to hit him, Ichi intervenes and tells him to run away. The gang members laugh at him, especially when he awkwardly charges at them. He clumsily engages in a fistfight, obviously not used to fighting. Despite this, he is able to defeat all of them, much to the man's shock. As they separate ways, the man expresses his gratitude to him for his help. Ichi continues to walk home and activates his enhanced senses. He hears that there is a fire somewhere and a family is trapped. He immediately searches for the location of the incident using his advanced eyesight, but discovers that it is too far away. In a hurry, 
He then tries to force activate his power of flight, looking for a switch in his back, thinking that if Hero can fly, he can too. He felt his back for a moment, willing himself to fly. As the pair of jetpacks open from his back, he promptly tries to fly, but his inexperience causes him to fall back to the ground just as fast. Determined to help, he flies again, and this time, he is able to soar above the sky. He finally reaches the house, engulfed in fire, and proceeds to help the family trapped inside. After he brings them all to safety, the father thanks him for his heroic act. Ichi tells them not to say anything about him to the police. As he walks home, he sheds tears, thankful that he was able to save innocent lives. The next day, Hiro visits Ando to bring him to school and promises to protect him. Ando comes with him, but he is still terrified of his bully classmates. They gang up on him, but Hiro intervenes, protecting his friend. He grabs one of the student's hands and holds it tightly, making him squirm in pain and asking him to apologize to Ando. Feeling excruciating pain, the student immediately apologizes to Ando and swears not to show up near him again while crying. However, the other bullies are not phased and tell him to come to the roof after their class. Later, Hiro and Ando go to the roof and see that the bully students are not there. Able to see things kilometers away, Hiro points out that the students have already left and are now walking with girls. Not seeing anything, Ando is confused. Hiro hands him binoculars, and as he searches for the bullies using them, he hears his friend firing his invisible bullets. He then sees the students fall one by one, lifeless. Shocked at the horrific act he just witnessed, Ando isn't able to react, even when Hiro tries to assure him that he will not be caught for the revenge he has done for him. He points out that no one can beat him, and that he must be the most powerful person in the world right now. After he shows Ando that he can steal money easily, he invites him to hang out in an arcade. However, overwhelmed by how his friend changed into a senseless killing machine, he declares that he can no longer be his friend anymore. Not feeling any remorse, Hiro can't understand his friend's sentiments. In an attempt to help him, Ando convinces him to turn himself in to the police, but Hiro vehemently refuses. Hearing this, Ando tells him not to come near him again. Hiro leaves, saying he should not skip school. Meanwhile, Ichi sees a mother cat and a kitten, remembering to walk Hago in the park after going home. However, the mother cat gets struck by a truck and slowly dies. He panics about what to do, and suddenly his power to heal gets activated. In no time, the cat regains its health and leaves with its kitten. Ichi is surprised by his newly discovered power and proceeds to go to a hospital. Inside, he heals the patients in grave conditions. Meanwhile, frustrated by what happened with his friend, Hiro goes on a killing spree and walks again inside a random house to victimize an innocent family. He stumbles upon playing kids in the streets and mercilessly aims for them. A beautiful young woman named Fumino gets invited by her co-worker to a group date, but she respectfully declines as she is already committed to her boyfriend. Intrigued, the co-worker asks about her boyfriend, and she reveals that he is a regular office worker with an average salary. Hearing this, the woman assumes that he must be a handsome guy. However, when the boyfriend, Satoru, appears, the co-worker's face falls, clearly not expecting what she is seeing. The couple goes home together in a modest apartment. Fumino observes that his boyfriend falls silent and asks what's wrong. Nervously, he proposes marriage, which the girl happily accepts. The following day, Fumino is beaming with joy as she works, but little does she know a man quietly stalks her. As she goes off to work, she chats with her boyfriend on the phone about their plans for the day. Suddenly, a van stops right in front of her, and several men emerge to abduct her. Eventually, she wakes up in an unfamiliar room, unclothed and disoriented. She looks around and sees a leader of the Yakuza, Samajima, and slowly approaching her to the bed with carnal desires. She fights him off and runs to the other room, equipping herself with a katana, desiring her, the man declares that he will make her his, no matter what. In desperation, Fumino frantically attacks him with the sword, injuring his hand in the process. As the man's goons tend to his wound, the girl quickly escapes. Meanwhile, Satoru anxiously waits for his girlfriend's return. Just then, Fumino alights from a cab, looking disoriented. Inside the house, she tells him what happened and how she got away with the Yakuza. Satoru offers to call the police, but she declines as she was injected with drugs and might be arrested. Feeling helpless, she cries in his arms as he promises to protect her. Suddenly, 
a group of men barged inside their apartment, revealing the man who tried to take advantage of her earlier. The man declares his intention to take her, but Satoru intervenes, offering them money to let them go. The man towers over him, mocking him by calling him ugly and pathetic. The young man cries, promising even more money for them to spare them. Insulted, the man grabs him by his neck and slowly takes his life as his girlfriend cries for him. Just then, one of the goons flies inside the apartment, revealing an angry Ichi. He fights the Yakuza, calling them unforgivable. Overpowering him, the man was baffled by his strength and armed himself to stop Ichi, firing at him several times. The old man falls to the floor, motionless. Later, Ichi regains consciousness and sees the young man beside him not breathing anymore. He tries to bring him back to life but discovers that it is beyond his abilities, and he cries for him. Refusing to give up, he resuscitates Satoru, promising to save his girl as well. In an unbelievably fortunate stroke of luck, the young man regains consciousness, immediately searching for Fumino, who appears to have been taken by the Yakuza. Overwhelmed by the horror of the situation, the young man can't help but cry, realizing that he is powerless against the Yakuza. Feeling bad for Satoru, Ichi calls the girl's phone and threatens Samajima that he will be coming for him to make sure that he can never do evil again. Determined to save the girl, Ichi flies to the Yakuza house and meets Samajima. He asks for Fumino, but the man refuses to give her back, emptying another round of bullets on him. Shocked by his superhuman abilities, the man asks what kind of person he is. Instead of answering, Ichi charges at him and punches him in the face, causing him to crash to the ground with a broken face. The man swears to kill him and everyone he loves to make him realize what kind of man he messed up with. Just then, the goons start firing at him with numerous firearms, not letting him survive. However, Ichi endures and uses his robotic body to fly up in the air, shocking the men. Unconscious and in his autopilot mode, he defeated all of them, leaving a trail of injured bodies in his wake. He regains consciousness a while later, witnessing the terrifying extent of his power as he renders them all blind. He tells them to repent for the rest of their lives, thinking about the people they have ruined. He then approaches Samajima, who is now blind as well, and locates Fumino. In a room, he sees her crying uncontrollably at the thought of never seeing Satoru again. He helps her calm down and dresses her. He then flew her to meet Satoru, allowing the two lovers to meet again. The events of last night are featured on the news, detailing the attack on high-ranking members of the Yakuza during a meeting. Ando's mother switches channels, where another report discusses the recent killings occurring in the town. According to the report, the victims' families were eradicated using bullets, yet no gunpowder residue was found at the scene. This revelation fills Ando with fear, as he knows exactly who is behind these horrific events. At the school, the students talk about the recent slaying of a group of male students, which remains a mystery. They are filled with fear, as they think that the killer is roaming freely around the school. Meanwhile, Hiro continues his normal life at school, as if he is not behind all the horrendous attacks, while Ando is being eaten up by his guilt. He tries to report his friend, but can't bring himself to do so. He then searches for recent incidents about him using the keyword, body machine. Instead of stumbling upon his friend's crimes, he discovers miraculous events like patients being cured of terminal illnesses. He remembers the time when Hiro healed his finger and shared that he could do other miraculous things. Confused, he thinks that Hiro is continuing to eradicate people while saving others. However, knowing his friend, he deems that this is not likely. Contemplating the events, he suspects that there is someone who can do what Hiro can and is the exact opposite of him. Thinking that the person can stop Hiro from further destruction, he resolves to find the individual. He thinks of a way to locate the person, and he remembers Hiro telling him that he can hear everything people say. Wanting to test his theory, he quietly calls for help from his room, saying that he is about to get slain. Just then, he hears someone at the door, asking his mother if they are being robbed. He rushes to answer the door and sees Ichi standing outside, ready to help. Seeing him unclothed, he deduces that he flew towards his house in a hurry. In his room, he asks Ichi if he is a robot, as his childhood friend is the same. Shocked that he knows, the old man tells him that he cannot forgive his friend for the horrific things he has done and vows to stop him. Ando questions if he is the man who performs the miracles around the city. Hearing this, Ando expresses his fascination with him, calling him a true hero. However, Ichi says that he's no hero as he still lacks aspects. Determined to put an end to the vicious things happening, 
He pleads with him to stop Hiro and promises to help in any way he can. The old man tells him that he might end up killing his friend, but he is resolute, as he isn't the friend he knows anymore and is just a killing machine now. Worried that Ichi is affected by his words, he tells them that he isn't a heartless robot eradicating everyone senselessly, but he is more human than anyone he has ever met. Hearing this gives Ichi a newfound confidence, and he bids goodbye to his new friend. The next day at school, a female student named Shion Watanabe confesses her feelings to Hiro after falling for his kindness when he stands up for Ando. However, the boy only smiles at her, saying thanks, and leaves. Later, Hiro is greeted by his father, who immediately apologizes for their cancelled fishing trip. His half-siblings greet him as well, bugging him for the comics they have been asking him. He celebrates his younger brother's birthday with his father's new family and spends time with them. Later, in a rundown apartment, he sees his mother falling asleep while waiting for him. As they get ready for bed, his mother informs him that she went to the hospital and was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer that had already spread to his lungs. She is told that she only has a month left to live. She tells him that she has already asked his father to take him in, and he promised to send him to college. Out of despair, Hiro hugs his mother, who cries in his arms, saying she doesn't want to die and leave him all alone. He promises to never let her die as he starts to heal her. Meanwhile, Ando flies with Ichi and discovers that one of his classmates is his daughter. They arrive at a junkyard, and Ando helps the old man practice his ability, as punching is all he can do for attacking. He reveals that he sometimes works on autopilot, and the next thing he knows is that the person is lying on the ground. The boy urges him to attack the stack using explosive power, but nothing comes out of him. Ando wonders if he can beat Hiro. Ichi is able to activate his arm cannon, and he is able to completely destroy a huge pile of pressed metal, leaving a dusty crater in the ground. The next day, Hiro receives a call from his mother saying that her cancer is already gone. The two happily talk in their home as Hiro reveals that he got 3 million yen from doing day trading. He proposes that they move into a bigger apartment and promises to support his mother from now on. Reluctant at first, the mother eventually agrees, not knowing that her son steals money using his superhuman powers. Meanwhile, Ichi and Ando go to a hospital to help people who are sick. As the old man heals children, the boy acts as his lookout and watches him cure people with awe, calling him a hero. In their apartment, Hiro watches the news with his mother, who comments on the recent terrible slayings. She condemns the culprit as a horrible person and expresses a desire to meet the parents who raised such a child. Hearing this, Hiro becomes affected and asks his mother what she would do if he were involved. After pondering for a moment, she tells him that she will follow him into the afterlife. Just then, a breaking news report announces that a witness has come forward in connection to the home invasions. Hiro and his mother get ready for their move and plan to unpack early. That night, Hiro vows to stop slaying people. The next day, authorities barged at their residence, determined to catch the boy. He attempts to escape, but they tackle him to the ground. The authorities point guns at Hiro, then restrain him. He watches as his mother cries, asking what he has done. Refusing to get imprisoned, he downs the police and runs away, ignoring his mother's pleas. He then flies away, crying at the impossibility of his situation. Using his power, he sees on the news that he is officially now a fugitive and that his personal information is being shown to the public. Just then, Xion appears, catching his attention. At school, students talk about how Hiro seems to be innocent and can't believe that someone normal looking like him could slay 15 innocent people. Meanwhile, while staying at Xion's residence, Hiro watches the news using his technology as they speculate that his troubled life is connected to his upbringing. Later, Xi'an goes home after the class and finds Hiro sitting in one corner of the room. As they talk, she reveals that her parents are now both dead from cancer, so she won't live that long either. Seeing that he isn't phased at all, she wishes for the police to catch the real killer soon. The three of them have dinner together, and thinking that he only ran away because of a misunderstanding, the grandmother offers to call his parents for him. Hiro politely declines, saying he will do it himself. That night, he watches Xi'an and her grandmother sleep, contemplating if he is going to kill them. The next day, they peacefully eat breakfast together. Meanwhile, Ando continues to help Ichi discover more about the potential of his power. He tells him that Hiro can integrate his mobile phone into his electronic system and gets him to do the same. He urges the old man to scan the USB port on a laptop, which makes him adapt the port to his finger. Ando connects his phone to it, 
making him see the interface of his phone. After setting up his number and information, Ando calls him, and Ichi can hear him inside his head. In this way, Ichi can call him hands-free while he is flying. Ichi tries his new discovery, flying up in the sky, while speaking with Ando on the phone. In testing the communication distance, Ichi flies as high as an orbiting satellite. Meanwhile, Hiro can't help but cry in the dark room as he watches a news report of his mother tearfully apologizing, saying her son has done something a human should never do. The online audience attacked their entire family, bombarding them with negative comments. Ando sees this as well, and says they have to find him before he kills his next victims. At dinner, Hiro can't help but be distracted, monitoring the news as they report that his mother is nowhere to be found. Things get worse later on, as a breaking announcement states that she has ended her own life. Distraught, the supposedly unemotional boy, walks out and flies high into the sky, weeping for the loss of his mother. The next morning, at his father's home, reporters flock to investigate further. Just then, the young man appears, one shot all the journalist, and simply leaves as the father begs for his life. Meanwhile, news of his mother's death remains unsafe for netizens, who laugh at the tragedy and insist that he brought it on himself. One person proudly claims to be the one who spread his photo and house address, daring the criminal to take him on personally. To his surprise, Hero appears on his monitor, confirming that the middle-aged man is who he claims to be. Instead of being afraid, the sleazy man actually laughs, repeatedly calling for his mother, excited that he's gotten a chance to speak to a serial killer. He replies to the boy's serious questions with mocking answers, although he is annoyed that his mother won't come to his room. Just then, a bullet shoots out of the monitor, hitting the TV in the room. Another hits the man's leg, and he finally realizes the situation he's in. While crying pathetically, he takes his words back, insisting that he lied about spreading the information. To his surprise, Hero flashes his email to the media, proving that he's guilty. A barrage of bullets shoots through, and the man desperately jumps around to dodge. He cowers in an area that should be in the monitor's blind spot, but the killer simply appears on a screen, giving him a clear shot. Proving his threat to all the people online, he posts a recording of what just happened, promising to take them all out one at a time. Some still don't believe it, and are met with instant death as they mock the threat on the screen. They all fall one by one, regardless of who they are and where they may be. As long as they participate in the online harassment, they will fall to hero. Back in the Watanabe house, Xi'an worries as her grandmother lets Hiro in. She asks if he was out for so long because of what happened with his mother, and offers to help him in any way they can. That night, he fell asleep in tears. Back when things were peaceful, Hiro led a normal life, strolling with friends and taking the train home. One day, he witnessed a man absent-mindedly walk into the tracks as the train sped by. He wakes up in the morning. His host checks on him in the morning, but he remains silent, so she makes her way to school where his crimes are a hot topic for students. An entire day goes by, but he's still in bed, not having moved an inch. Xi'an enters his room late at night, saying things would get better when the police caught the killer. Hearing her talk about his misfortune, he realizes that he hasn't told her about him yet. He shares that he is in fact the killer who's taken out dozens of lives. She's in disbelief of what she's hearing, but the boy continues, saying he entered a different house every week, committing the crime like it was nothing. He apologizes, as he isn't human anymore. At a park one night, he died and became something else. Since then, he couldn't stop thinking that he was just a machine, made of steel and without a heart, a bottomless darkness. All he felt was fear, but he remembered the man who jumped in front of a train. While others ran or took pictures, he felt a light over someone's life being erased. That day, he chose to bet everything on the light. As he says this, he takes a box cutter, saying all he could think of was taking lives indiscriminately, as if he were possessed. The more they struggled, the more he felt like a human again. He digs the box cutter into his arm, but the blade simply snaps against it. She still insists that he's a normal person, so he turns back and opens his mechanical body, demanding that she look at him properly. Determined to convince her, he drags the young lady out, hugging her tightly from behind before flying up into the sky. As she's screaming, he says that the whole world has become his enemy, and he'll kill everyone in the country. Feeling his grip loosen, she wails and begs him to not leave them, begging him to stay in their home. While he can't understand her priorities, he tightens his hold once more, 
and promises to stay with them forever. That said, he can't turn himself in, nor can he return the lives he took. The girl can't stop crying and complaining, so he asks what she wants him to do exactly. She feels distraught over his crimes, more so that they can't do anything about it anymore. As such, he promises to save the lives of people instead. Now feeling hopeful for a new life, they land back down and share a warm hug. In an office in the city, Nakao does her work as usual when her boss asks her out for lunch. There he checks on her condition, asking if she's taking the proper treatment for her cancer. However, it's terminal, so all she takes are pain relievers. There's no one for her to spend time with, so she puts the rest of her life into working. Feeling pity, the man tells her to let him know if she needs help. When the day ends, she commutes around the city, where she sees loving couples, bright children, and happy crowds, all of which are much different from her. She begins to weep, shouting that she wants to live. Later on, she sees a post online, asking terminally ill people to contact them, as the poster may be able to help. It looks like an obvious joke to her, but she humors it out of desperation. At the meeting spot, Hiro arrives a little late and takes her hands beginning the healing process. Finishing within moments, he announces that she should be cured. She should get examined in the hospital tomorrow and send out a post confirming her recovery. The next day, her boss is shocked to find her in the office, looking like a new person. With this, more people approach the mysterious savior, wishing to be cured for free. While most are doubtful, they are all equally on their last legs and have no one else to turn to. His good deeds begin to spread among the people, and they reach different regions just to help those in need. However, two months later, the students still talk about Hero and how he hasn't been caught yet, sharing different speculations about his current state. Meanwhile, the two fly over the night sky as usual, with the young man twirling and diving like a roller coaster to make things more exciting, uncaring of the eyes that see them. Together they fly off into the sea, illuminated by the moon's glow. Hiro hugs Xion tight, promising to cherish her forever and stay with them forever. Back at the house, the two share a light dinner with their grandmother and quickly doze off. Just then, several figures moved from the streets, making their way into the family's lot. The intruders seemed to be highly skilled soldiers, all armed and ready to fight. The residents of Watanabe House are sleeping peacefully, unaware of the danger that's approaching. Xi'an gets up to go to the bathroom, but is shocked to find multiple rifles pointed at her when she returns. Quickly realizing why they're there, she shouts at Hiro to run away. The soldiers gun their grandmother down, quickly following with the girl. Outside, there are several civilians, just watching and listening to the chaos happening. They unleash a barrage of bullets at the young man, who sees the bodies of the people that took him in on the floor, bleeding from multiple wounds. Furious, furious, he blasts the wall open and escapes into the sky, carrying the two women. He lays their bodies by the park, crying and apologizing for what he caused. The news in the morning reports that a large asteroid is rapidly approaching the Earth and is expected to cause enormous damage in the event of impact. At school, a couple of students talk about the news of the asteroid, making people completely forget about Hero. Meanwhile, officials having dinner discuss how the boy took out an elite squad all by himself. They complain about how the suspect is an unprecedented case, adding that the mission to catch him is far beyond their pay grade. Meanwhile, Mari follows Ando home and begins asking several questions about his father. Although she was being friendly early on, her attitude suddenly turns sour as they talk about his aspirations to become a mangaka in the future. Considering his family's wealth, she thinks he's way too greedy, walking away when he says it's a separate matter. In the young man's room, Ichi talks about how his daughter used to cling to him when she was younger, thinking that he might die soon as he looked too old. He's surprised to know that she's very popular at school, looking like she won't give the time of day to just anyone. As they talk about this, Mari is in her room, furious over the boy's words. While drawing manga panels herself, she promises to take them down and build a house bigger than theirs. The partners use the old man's powers, remotely pulling a car into the driveway. He did well, but their target is ten times stronger. The next day, Maris and her classmate talk about going to an art school together, but she says it's too expensive for her. Later, she's shocked to see Ando and her father together, even following them into the subway. She thinks he might be trying to marry her off. However, given the old man's personality, he probably couldn't. She follows them into a hospital and is shocked to find out that they're the pair causing miracle recoveries. Her jaw drops farther down, 
as she sees her father fly into the sky with boosters. She returns home in silence. Ichi returns as well, unaware that his wife and daughter are discussing the child's report card inside. Mari says she won't go to college anyway, and ignores her mother's lecture about how things work in the real world. She insists on handling things herself, saying she plans to debut as a manga artist soon. Just then, her father entered the room. The spouses talk about her future, but the young lady is surprised to hear that her father will support her passion as long as she graduates high school properly. She immediately promised to do so. Xi'an, miraculously alive, returns to a different apartment and tells her grandmother that half a million yen was transferred into their account. At the police station, Hiro calls a guard's attention, telling him to take a close look. The man sweats hard upon realizing who it is, and he gets killed instantly. It doesn't take long for the rest of those in the building to suffer the same fate. Some officers sneak through the station, following the trail of the massacre. They shoot at the boy endlessly and look for his gun after running out of bullets. Regaining consciousness, the criminal uses his finger to shoot them all down. The superior steps in to manually subdue him. Unaware of the boy's physical strength, he's quickly overpowered and taken out. Knowing that they were all coming after him anyway, Hiro says he just saved them the trip. An officer threatens that the entire police force will never stop until they catch him. He leaves the man alive out of spite, telling him to watch as he eliminates their whole organization. Outside, the criminal is met with countless officers. A sniper takes the first shot, sending him flying, and the others quickly follow with an unending barrage of bullets. The media reports it live, and people wonder why so many men are shooting a single boy for so long. They soon report his death, just as the police are confining it. However, something awakens in him, and he flies into the sky. They resume shooting, but cannons emerge from Hero's body and shoot fatal beams of light at every soldier. With the threat subdued, his body falls, still unconscious. Rain begins to pour into his mouth, and he regains energy enough to function again. He shoots the remaining officers there, and sees the one he left alive in the building. The man admits defeat, but the boy simply walks off into the night, saying it's still far from over. The news reports that the previous night's shootout at the police station led to 85 deaths. Ichi's family talks about the perpetrator being Mari's classmate, but she quickly dismisses it. The young criminal is the hot topic at school as well, with some calling him a monster, and a select few expressing their admiration. Some fan bases for him have formed as well, and are putting up heroic posters in the city. Through a press conference, Hiro's actions are announced as a declaration of war against the entire country, and the police vow to do everything they can to neutralize him. Given the escalating situation, Ando and the old man have been trying to reach the boy, but he's blocked off communications. Just then, Hiro hijacks the big screens throughout Shinjuku's streets. As he's going to be pursued endlessly anyway, he goes ahead and makes an enemy of the entire country, saying he won't stop until he's taken out each and every citizen on it. Pointing a finger at the camera on his palm, he begins the massacre, and people begin to get shot down one by one. People are still unaware of his power to bypass electronic devices, and believe that the shooter is aiming from a rooftop somewhere. A helicopter surveying the city reports that the streets of Shinjuku have emptied as people flock to their homes. The news anchor receives a direct call from Hiro and goes about how he'll never be forgiven. A bullet speeds through his head and the broadcast is cut off. From this, Ando figures out how he's attacking through smartphones. A child receives a call from the criminal and is told to put the device to his ear. However, a text announces the culprit's mode of killing, prompting the boy to throw his phone away. Everyone else receives the same announcement, and they all discard their phones with no hesitation. As Hiro realizes that his plans are being interrupted, Ichi is working hard to hijack phones and send out the announcement. With everyone feeling safer, they begin to evacuate. However, the young man uses other screens instead, and unleashes a flurry of bullets at everyone watching. Knowing that they can't let this continue, Ichi runs out to look for the boy in Shinjuku, wanting to do something about it himself. The casualties quickly rise to a hundred, and he pauses the massacre, saying that he's reached the quota for that day. It was the test run, so it took him half an hour to reach a hundred people. Tomorrow, it'll be the real thing, and he'll take out a thousand people every day. The old man stops running upon hearing the announcement, pained that he was unable to do anything. At night, Hiro considers Ando his main enemy, realizing how his old friend is using his secrets and working with the police. Although quite unusual, 
The reporter advises everyone to heed the criminal's warning. As the children complain about being told to leave their phones behind, the news anchor talks about a force that might go against the killer, explaining the text announcements that appeared on everyone's phone all throughout the Kanto region. For some reason, people are still being called to school and work despite the situation. Hiro speaks to Xi'an remotely, asking why they're living in a dingy apartment. She says that they haven't used the money he lent them, and pleads that he stop with the killing. However, the entirety of Japan is already against him, so he has no choice but to eliminate everyone there if they want to live together in peace. While he's asking where she wants to move to once the country is defeated, the girl looks down in disappointment and walks away. Mari acts like nothing is going on, unafraid of the killer on the loose. On the other hand, her father is working hard, trying to search for the criminal through sound waves. Ando has been looking as well. Although nothing has happened, he's certain that the young man will come up again soon. Hiro reaches out to Xi'an, trying to convince her that the three of them can live in Hawaii. Her tears fall, so he cuts the connection. Meanwhile, a woman makes her way through the airport and tells a man named Goro that she should arrive soon, asking him to pick her up. She boards the plane and sits next to a father carrying his baby. The aircraft takes off, making the baby cry from air pressure. She calms it down by showing a fun video on her phone. A stewardess approaches upon seeing her phone, but leaves as she sees that they're using it to soothe the baby. Mari continues on with her day out, unaware of the tragedy that's about to ensue. Reports remind people to leave their phones at home, but the stillness prompts people to doubt Hero's warning. However, the criminal raises his arms, ready to resume the massacre. Just then, everyone looks up in terror and sees that a plane is descending right in the middle of the city. It comes crashing down the street in smoke, and the fatalities don't even need to be confirmed. Ando looks on in horror, knowing what just happened. A few office workers in Tokyo look out their windows, wondering what's happening. Ichi listens in to the screams of terror as passengers say goodbye to their loved ones. Outside, several planes are falling from the sky, landing on different establishments and crashing into buildings. Mari, who's enjoying her free time in a building, watches on as a plane rapidly descends in their direction. Realizing what's happening, the old man flies into the sky and sees the city in flames as multiple aircrafts have crashed to the ground. With no time to blame himself for being too late, Ichi receives a call from Ando, saying that the second wave is coming, and that he has to stop them this time. Hiro keeps on moving his arms around, as if orchestrating a huge tragedy. From inside the plane, the woman from before sees the other aircrafts around them losing altitude. Suddenly, every passenger is lifted from their seats, as their own vehicle goes into a nosedive. However, they fortunately sit back up as Ichi stops them from falling. Unable to take full control, the plane loses a wing, and Hiro realizes that someone is messing with his plans. The old man manages to gently land the second wave on the shore, keeping everyone safe. However, Mari suddenly calls him, crying for help as they're trapped by a fire inside the building. The civilians think of drastic measures, and the young girl begs her father to save them, saying she's at the observation deck in Shinjuku. He gets ready to leave but freezes and turns slowly as he hears Hiro's voice behind him. However, the young man quickly realizes that they're the same, as Ichi withstands a shot from his finger. The two have opposing ideals when it comes to using their powers, and what it takes to feel like a human again. It's clear who the hero and villain in the story is, but the boy clenches his fist in anger, questioning why he's the bad one. Unwilling to let the man save his daughter, he punches him in the face and proceeds to pummel him with hits and bullets. Desperate to fight back, Ichi is able to use a finger gun for the first time. Annoyed by the retaliation, he opens his arm up to fire a stronger gun, but the man blasts into the sky. He follows in hot pursuit, unleashing laser beams and causing a huge explosion in the sky. After successfully evading, he continues to head to his daughter, screaming as her pleas turn more desperate. A huge chase ensues, and the pursuer's efforts seem to be completely ineffective. Mari calls again, but this time, she's giving her father her final goodbyes, finally telling her father that she loves him. Her voice disappears, but he'll stop at nothing to reach her eventually. He fights back and knocks the boy unconscious, but the system automatically defends itself, now sending countless beams at Ichi, who's also knocked unconscious. Now, the fight is between the two systems powering their bodies. They speed throughout the sky, locked in a deadly battle for survival. The old man makes a satellite explode, 
using the debris to sneak an attack. Mounting Hero's back, he tears his metal head open and follows by ripping the arms off. The conversation with Xi'an flashes through his mind. She insisted that his victims had their own lives, but all he cared about was her and her grandmother. The girl cries hard as she remembers how he was supposed to pick her up, but is now hurtling in the sky. Ichi regains consciousness and flies toward his daughter. In the burning building, he sees her body, unmoving and lifeless. He tries desperately to bring her back, but it's already too late. He screams in anguish, remembering his memories with the child from the moment she was born. Unable to accept their fate, he does chest compressions, not stopping despite knowing that it's hopeless. He cannot help but cry in pain, apologizing and thanking his precious child as he finally closes her eyes. As he's walking away, she suddenly lets out a faint cough. He rushes back to her and uses his powers to help her recover. Her coughing becomes stronger, and as her heart and lungs begin to work again, realizing that she's safe, she hugs her father tightly, wailing about what happened. He brings her back to the street, confirming that she's okay. He flies back to save others. The man returns with Nao, her friend, safe and sound. Soon enough, several people are brought back to the ground and saved one by one. As the others walk away to head home, Mari looks at her father's back in admiration. He tells her to head home, saying he'll be back in the morning. Throughout the night, paramedics, reporters, and everyone that saw Ichi stared in wonder as he dragged victims back from the brink of death. Videos of his deeds float around online, and people wonder if God has come down to earth. Ando sees the videos and cries in awe of his partner. Tokyo is going up in black smoke, and officials are unsure of the connection between Hiro and the plane crashes. In the sky, Ichi vows to help as much as he can, thinking about the last 58 years of his life and realizing that this must be the reason he was born. His morals, experiences, and even getting turned into a machine were all built up for this moment. Meanwhile, two women chance upon Hiro's body and grant his request for something to drink. Ichi returns home and cautiously opens the door to the living room. Inside, his family is standing together, staring at him with frozen faces. On the TV, news reports showing him saving people are playing. They ask if it's really him, so he kneels down in apology and opens up his mechanical body, saying he might not be the person they knew before and that he might just be a machine that was built to look like their family. Seeing their shocked expressions, he gets up to leave after apologizing, but his wife stops him. She asks what they did for their honeymoon and hugs him tight after getting a detailed retelling of their day together. Mari cries, shouting that it's obviously him and telling him to stay. The next day, everyone is talking about how Ichi saved 33 planes and countless people. Ando smiles as he hears this and goes about his day. When he returns home, he's shocked to find Hiro waiting in his room. He says that the old man was really strong. In a turn of events, they oddly read a manga volume together, acting as if nothing happened. Ando is asked if he's going to school again and if others are still bullying him. Saying that he's fine now, he excuses himself and tells Ichi about the situation. He returns to the room, where Hiro asks mundane questions about his life. He admits calling the old man, but his old friend says he's disinterested in fighting and only came to check on how he's been doing and read manga like old times. However, he's called a merciless killing machine, bringing tears into his eyes. The old man arrives, but the criminal has already left. Alone, the young man browses the internet and sees the countless calls for him to be executed. Soon after, he follows Xi'an and her grandmother to their apartment, but tears up as he leaves without showing himself. In the Inuyashiki household, they lightly talk about how Ichi hasn't been recognized at work, but his youngest son is observably uncomfortable. While the people around him talk about the amazing hero, they bully him for being poor. They run into each other on the way home, and the boy shares that he wants to be a machine as well, to receive praise and an unending life. His father talks about how fickle life is and how he should have valued himself, even before becoming a machine. They walk home in silence. The next day, their family has a pleasant breakfast, and Marie shares that she submitted her work to a publishing company. They move to a nearby river and enjoy spending time out together after a long while. At home, the TV plays a message from the American president, announcing that their efforts to stop the incoming asteroid have all failed, and that a collision will take place in three days. Life as they know it is ending, and they can do things without consequence. The following days, P-1000 
people live as they want, parading unclothed, preaching, and even taking others' lives. In the Inuyashiki house, they talk about the idea of passing away together, instead of going one by one. Everyone else copes with impending doom somehow. Ando and Ichi had never expected this to happen, but the old man wants to try until the end. He might not be able to make a difference, but he can hear the cries of people from all over the world, begging for help. Thinking about his family, he promises to return. Readying himself, the old man fills up on water and says goodbye to his family secretly. Mari catches him and gets him to admit his plans. He walks out, determined to do his best, but she pulls him back, wanting her father to stay. The rest of the family wake up, and Hago even runs after him, unable to follow as he takes flight. Beyond Earth's atmosphere, he arrives at the asteroid. Despite pulling pieces out and shooting his beams, all he does is make a small hole. Ando tells him to go back to his family, but he searches for a meaning to it all, shooting more lasers. His fuel has run out, but is shocked to find that Hero has appeared beside him. While he's the villain in this story, he still has people he wants to protect. Thinking about shifting the trajectory, the young man reminds him of the day they transformed, where a voice told them that they had the power to destroy the Earth. After running simulations, he found that blowing himself up would shift the asteroid's path just enough to miss the planet. Back at home, he can hear Xion's desperately calling out to him. Having lost his arms, he asks the old man to push his eyes into his head to activate the process. Ichi calls Ando and explains the situation. The boy cries and runs out, unable to understand the sudden sacrifice of his old friend. He pushes his eyes in, and the self-destruct commences. The explosion shines on Japan, and Hiro's sources of sacrifice weep. The dust clears, but another simulation shows that the asteroid is still set to hit the planet. More missiles won't work, but another self-destruction will. He tells Ando that his friend has saved them all, and promises to see him tomorrow. However, he stays on the asteroid and pushes his eyes in, having accepted his fate. The precious moments of his life flash through his mind. His family, his home, and his friends are his last thoughts as Ichi's body explodes, disintegrating the asteroid with him. With this, everyone is safe, but those who value him are left in pain. Sometime later, Mari heads into a convenience store and browses through the pages of a manga volume. To her shock, she sees that her work has won the contest she desperately longed for. She runs to her mother, excited to share the news. 